Thanks very much, Andy. And um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and, and it is a great pleasure to be here um, uh, at the Cambridge Conservation Initiative. I've been uh, aware of, of what's been happening here for a long time uh, because I came up here for a meeting once with, with Bill and others from the initiative. Uh, but it's actually just fantastic to see it in reality. And uh, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons for wanting to stand up here today and speak to you is that uh, DEFRA, as a Department of State, with specific interest in the areas that you're interested in, really wants to engage and make use of this initiative. Uh, and part of the discussion, I hope, that will evolve uh, out of what I say and, and the panel discussion afterwards, because I'm just kind of the warm-up act for that, is how, how do we make that work better than it has in the past? Because I think there are some, some real challenges there. Um, I also see in the audience uh, a lot of um, old friends, um, uh, uh, new faces, but a lot of very familiar faces of people who um, have a tremendous amount of experience in this area. Um, and I almost feel as if after just a, just a bit under four years in the job, they've been asked, they've asked me along here to test me out to see whether I've really learned anything at all about science and policy making. Andy introduced me as a sub policy maker. If you said that in DEFRA, they just laugh, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I'm seen as the core scientist in DEFRA, but actually within the science community, I'm seen as a policymaker. So I sit right on that divide. Um, I still think as, of myself as a scientist, I have to say. Um, and that comes to the, the, the very sort of title of this talk, what do policymakers want from scientists? Uh, there are two social groups there. There are policymakers and there are scientists. And they think in very different ways. And um, uh, Bill, in his introduction, talked about values. Policymakers are very focused on values, whether it's economic value or social value and all these other things. Scientists are, are, are not, not totally without values, obviously, but, but actually very much focused on the facts of a case, et cetera, et cetera. So there are very different view, points of view. And uh, the, the question is, how can we make those points of view actually work, uh, work better together? We also have a sort of customer-supplier relationship there, um, in that, as a science community, we uh, want policy to actually take the products that we produce and use those products. Uh, but in the, in the modern parlance of customer-supplier, it's not about um, DEFRA or some other organization ordering a piece of science and then taking that information away and using it in whatever way it wants. It's about building structured relationships um, uh, between the customer and the supplier, so that the customer understands what the problems are with the supply and the science, and at the same time, uh, the, the, the supplier understands what the customer's needs really are. So if we, can, if we can build that into some of the thinking we have around the interface between policymakers and scientists, uh, then I think that would be, uh, would be very important. Um, in the past few years, uh, Bill and others have done an excellent job of zeroing in on the, the top 20, top 50, top 100. I don't know, it goes on. Uh, sometimes it's 500, I don't know. Uh, 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 problems in a, a number of areas, conservation, marine, um, uh, uh, agri-science, uh, ecological questions, global questions, uh, national questions, etc. And one of the, one of the things that, that, uh, that Bill uh, published was, was about the 20 things that politicians need to know about science. Uh, and of, of course, I, I would say politicians and policymakers. Uh, and just to pull out four of these, uh, no measurement is exact, uh, bias is rife, correlation does not imply causation, effect size matters. And there are, the, 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 there are another 16 of them. Um, I think sometimes, as a scientific community, we don't admit to those as much as we should in front of those who are doing policy making. And we're not as, as open, and if you like, as honest as we might be about some of these, these issues. There are obviously some very positive things about science that, that, that um, policy makers need to know about. Uh, and Chris Tyler from the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology uh, has countered with the 
20 things that scientists need to know about, about policy making. And I would certainly back up what Chris Tyler says, and I've picked out four of them. Um, making policy is really difficult. Now, I used to study the, the dynamics of the ecology of the Southern Ocean. You'd think that's actually a difficult problem. But actually, it's really quite simple compared with some of the things that actually have to be solved within the Whitehall context. Um, and no policy will ever be perfect either. So we need to, we need to build that into the thinking. Um, Policymakers can be experts too. I'm going to come back to this in a little while. Actually, an immense number of the policymakers in DEFRA are scientists or social scientists. Um, Gemma Harper, who's sitting down here, is going to be in the panel, is the head of social science. In, in uh, chief social scientist in DEFRA, uh, but she's also in charge of marine policy. So we have policymakers and, uh, as, as scientists and scientists as policymakers. Um, uh, another, another issue that uh, Chris Tyler raised was uh, there's more to policy than science. I think probably most of you uh, uh, recognize that, but I think that one of the one of the terms that really annoys me more than any, anything else is evidence-based policy. Now, it's not that no policy is evidence-based, or it's not that there aren't policies that are totally evidence-based, but actually most policies are evidence-informed. They're not really evidence-based because they, they have this values element to them, and that's what the political process uh, brings in as well. Roger Pelkey uh, from Col Col Colorado State um, lamented uh, much more eloquently than I could do um, that uh, you come across scientists who just say, who say, if only the policymakers could understand a bit more of the science. And he then he says, you come up the, against the policymakers who say, if only some of the scientists could understand what, 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 what the policy um, is doing or saying, then we'd be a lot better off. Um, I actually think in the UK we do a pretty good job of this. Uh, uh, although, uh, as I said, I think we could be a, a lot better. As a scientist, I would have expected that a lot of the kind of work that Bill has done and others have done over the years in terms of trying to build a, a framework of informing policy about what the scientific literature says, particularly about conservation, would have had a greater impact. Why is policy not just lapping this stuff up and actually integrating it into its thinking and building wonderful new policies? Well, I think there are a lot of, uh, a lot of reasons for that, uh, uh, but actually a lot of them come down to barriers uh, and understanding the barriers. And if we understand as a scientific community, understand what those barriers to uptake actually are and think about how we can get around those barriers, then we'll be a lot better off. And, and I have to say, I, I was interested in this handout that, that came uh, as I walked in about the new uh, 100 priority questions. Uh, you know, in, in policy, if you just presented with 100 questions, we just, we just absolutely uh, 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 fall apart because we just cannot deal with that sort of avalanche of information. Three or four questions, maybe. But 100, no, I don't think we can deal with that. So, yes. Great idea, get the 100 questions out there. But when you're actually taking them to the policy community, filter it. Filter it to what the policy community actually wants. Because there are three basic main barriers. One is structural, the other one is political, and the other one is conceptual or cultural. In terms of structural, resource limitation is a huge barrier to uptake. Uh, I think people look at organizations like DEFRA and they think, well, 20,000 staff, you know, you must have the capacity to take this up. Actually, most of the time we don't. That's, that's, that's the, so it has to be packaged in such a way that it can be picked up and taken on and used very, very quickly and easily. It's also difficult for you to package it for a defined customer because sometimes the organizational structure is nebulous. It's quite difficult to put your finger on the person who you need to speak to. There's systemic inertia, uh, and that's just the consequence of the, the large organizational structure there is, the complexity of the organizational structure, and it takes a, a long time for, this, for the system to respond uh, depending on, on the particular um, issues. Corporate memory is very, very short. 
Um, and this is partly just due to the system there is. People turn over in jobs very quickly. We're used to being in jobs for decades within the scientific community. Uh, within the policy community, two, three years is probably usually about the maximum. So you can expect to see a different face almost every time you move into, into the department. That's just the nature of the beast. You've got to work with it, unfortunately. Um, behaviors and ways of working. Uh, the policy community is actually, uh, you'd be surprised, it's very non-adversarial. It's very consensual, very cooperative, uh, very consultative. Um, so it's not like a scientific community where actually there's a lot of adversarial uh, chit-chat going on. It's one of, if you actually present it in that way, people will actually step back from it and think, well, what's going on here? I don't really understand this social dynamic. And the final uh, one about, uh, about structure is trust. Uh, you have to build trusted relationships between you and those in the, in the policy um, community. Politically, timing is important. Um, finding, well, I put a, a note here, finding the way through the clutter of society is what politics does. Uh, and finding a, a window of opportunity in that clutter to be able to make your point. But waiting for that window of opportunity and being sensitive enough to understand that politically the window is opening and there's, a, there's an opportunity for you there. I've been told five minutes, so I'd better get on. Um, uh, relevance, uh, look at the party manifestos. Um, there are a lot of things which just will not happen simply because it is not the priority of the moment. Again, this comes back to the issue of timing and the window of opportunity. The other is, issue is political capital. Changing policy takes a long time and uh, uh, you've got to ask the question whether the people you're speaking to um, have the wherewithal, have the political capital in order to be able to make the changes that you're suggesting. Coming to cultural, there's complexity. I've already kind of mentioned that. But the complexity of policy as well, the simplest policies are the easiest ones to implement. One of the reasons why we have all the problems with CAP is it's just so complicated. Uh, and I could say that with the common fisheries policy as well and other t similar environmental policies. Risk aversion is an issue. Um, but on the positive side, there's a lot of invisible absorption of information into the system. It's systematized in ways that sometimes you don't understand. And as a result of that, scientists almost certainly over, uh, sorry, underestimate the impact they're having a lot of the time. You can walk out of an interaction with policymakers thinking, God, I haven't made any progress there. But actually, if you keep on at it, it actually does, uh, does sink in. Uh, and that comes to the final point about structure. Time scales are really important. It takes decades to change policies um, uh, 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 or certain types of policies. Uh, and you know, the CFP and the, CA and the, and the CAP are, are classic examples of those decadal processes. Um, I've got to, got to speed up here a bit. Um, I was going to give, or I am going to give an example of uh, one policy that uh, hasn't worked very well, and that's about badger culling. Um, something that has taken a lot of my life up, uh, but it's taken my lo a lot of my life up not because actually the policy is necessarily wrong. There's no right and wrong in these sorts of things. It's partly because I have been the interlocutor between a scientific community that has not built the trust with the policy community that it probably needs to do. Uh, and getting the policy community to actually listen to the scientific evidence um, has been an extraordinarily difficult thing to do in that area. There are other really good examples of where it really has worked. I think it's working with bees and neonicotinoids. I think it's working with marine conservation zones. I think it's working with flood resilience. I think it's working with GM. And the latest one, which I know is in Gemma's area, is microplastics. I think we're beginning to make progress in some of these areas. And there are a lot of very, very good, very positive stories. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to f flip on a bit and just say that um, what I think policymakers really need from scientists is strategic guidance to problem definition and solving. And I'll go back to badgers and TB uh, as an example of where that failed, because I think what the scientific community did was to articulate that 
as an epidemiological problem. It's bovine tuberculosis, you've got infections in cattle, you've got infections in badgers, you apply epidemiology to the problem. It's not an epidemiological problem. It's a social problem. It's a social problem with farmers. It's how you get farmers to take up methodologies that will actually combat that disease. And I think from that perspective, the scientific community really didn't grip what, that, what the problem of bovine tuberculosis has been all about. So that's the one, one thing. So the second thing is just to provide true, what I would call intellectual support to see the problems that policymakers are dealing with from the root cause upwards. Now I know that Bill talked about uh, the details of some of the, 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 the policy initiatives, what works and what doesn't work. That is important, it's really important. But before you get to that, you need to help the policy community understand how to build new policy from the start. You need to lead the policy. One of the areas I'm very keen that the scientific community really steps up to lead on is on pesticides policy. One of the reasons we've got the problems with neonicotinoids is because the pesticides policy is rooted in the early 1970s, and we've learned a lot since then, and it hasn't been taken up, and, and uh, the policy has not been revised as a result. Finally, sorry, Andy, I know I'm, I'm over time. Finally, I think that the solution to this, the practical solution to this, it can be uh, in, uh, implemented in a number of different ways. I think I'm, I'm the chief scientific advisor to DEFRA, but we can all be advisors to DEFRA in our own ways if we understand the social dynamic with the policymakers. So I think we need more CSAs, um, but in having more CSAs, we need to present ourselves as being authoritative, we need to be trusted, um, we need to be integrated within that, uh, that, that community, we need to be seen to be wise, both politically and scientifically. We need to be organizationally literate. In other words, we need to understand that DEFRA and government is a big organization, a big structure, and how do we actually work with that? Um, we need to be social, we need to be intellectual, in other words, we need to be bright, and we need to be knowledgeable. I think all those things probably um, um, apply to these people, the people in this room. And what I want to do is, within a DEFRA context at least, is make sure the structures are there to allow that interaction to happen. So we have a Science Advisory Council, and we're currently looking at all our Science Advisory Committees to tr try and perhaps revise them, to try and bring in new talent, new ideas. Um, we're looking at potential secondments, studentships, fellowships, joint appointments. I'm a joint appointment, so you know, if, if people think I do a reasonable job, then it works. So we can have much more of this in the, in the future. And the more that we have of that, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, finally, I would say that open policy making is uh, an important part of this. So actually, in open policy making, it's you that make the policy and bring it to the policy makers, rather than the policy makers thinking this up in a vacuum and, and coming to the scientific community. I will make one final comment, though, um, and that's about building common understanding, and again, this word trust. Um, and I think the, the way that we're going to get better trusted relationships in the future is not just using the kind of mechanisms I've just described, but also, ultimately, we need to get more scientists into politics. We have very few scientists in the House of Commons, and that means that you have to stand for Parliament at some point <laughs> or other. And I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. <laughs>